That's Jimmy Stein. I'm Clint Lamb, and this is the Bama Online YouTube channel. Or you could also be listening to the podcast version of this, which is, you know, totally fine. Jimmy, we got an interesting topic to talk about today. Uh, we already discussed the uh, 66-10 victory over UT Chattanooga on Saturday. Now Alabama turns its attention to the Auburn Tigers for the annual Iron Bowl. And then you got the Georgia Bulldogs after that. But we're here to talk about that Iron Bowl because it's really interesting. Um, obviously, you've got a lot on the line here. If you lose this game, it doesn't matter. You, you know, they're going to the SEC championship that's already been determined, but you can't afford to drop this game this weekend because if you do, it doesn't matter what happens in the SEC championship, you're not going to be going to the college football playoff. And it's going to be easier said than done. I know a lot of people are looking at that. Uh, ugly loss that Auburn had to New Mexico State this past weekend. Um, you know, there's some different ways of looking at it, but what are your thoughts on the Iron Bowl? I know it's still early. It's only Tuesday. That's when we're recording this. Still a lot to determine as far as, you know, um, there's still a lot to look at as far as matchups and all those things. But what are your initial thoughts on the Iron Bowl going in? Well, Gene Stallings used to say, Clint, that, uh, hey, if you don't think this is a big game, try losing it. Uh, so any Alabama fan that, uh, that that's like, oh, they, they don't have the horse power, the firepower, where are they going to find points? How are they going to stop Jalen Milrow? Alabama's way more balanced. All, all the reasons that Alabama's a big favorite in the game, I get all of them, and, and I think all of those reasons are the reasons Alabama will win the game. But my point is, you lose this game, we're talking about this game for a long time long long time this will not be a game that if you lose we won't be discussing it next august next september <laughs> no no this would be talked about for a long long time because you lost to a 15 point underdog your biggest rival uh that knocked you out of the playoffs uh or or potentially being in the playoffs so it would be a a, a horrible horrible loss and that's reason in and of itself to look at it like it's a big game because a loss would be devastating. And anytime a loss would be devastating, it's a big game. And uh, it is. And it's an SEC road game. Let's remember it wasn't too long ago, Clint, you and I were often worried about Alabama road performances. And here we go into a place where Alabama has had some failures in the past and where Alabama is probably better than Auburn and lost a time or two over there. So there's enough reason for some real anxiety here, but the matchup of the Jimmys and the Joes is decidedly in Alabama's favor. I think even the most ardent Auburn fan would uh, agree with that. Yeah, and, and that's why you can't – there's only so much that you can take away from games like New Mexico State. Like, even though I feel like Auburn – they have been playing probably their best football of the year, and then they turn around and they play the, their worst game of the year by far. They were completely controlled uh, on both lines of scrimmage. Uh, I feel like that New Mexico State was able to control the tempo of the game, dictate how they wanted to attack Auburn, whether it be offensively or defensively, and were having enough success at both to be fairly effective for four quarters. And, I mean, when you look at that and you try to compare it to, okay, now you've got Alabama – Alabama from a matchup standpoint, there isn't, I mean, okay, we'll start with this and I'll go ahead and kick it back to you because I am interested to hear what you have to say about this. Is there anywhere that you look at this Auburn roster and you say they're clearly better than Alabama, or you say, this is an area that I think, you know, maybe they could give Alabama trouble, whether that be something that they do defensively, offensively, a position group, because when you look at the matchup on paper, at least for me, um, I'm having a tough time finding some of those spots. I think Auburn's good in a couple of spots, and this is where I think Auburn can give Alabama some level of trouble. I think the Auburn corners are good players, and I don't think Alabama's outside receivers are going to have just free reign to march up and down the field like they have in maybe some other games. For instance, it felt like against Texas A&M that Jermaine Burton was open for the entire 60 minutes and would have been open for the entire 180 minutes had they played three games in a row. Uh, they just didn't have a corner that could cover him. I, I, I think against Auburn, uh, they do have some pretty good corners, and Alabama's receivers, the outside receivers, won't have 
just free reign to march up and down the field. So that's one spot. I think Auburn's good. I think where Auburn is also good that's likely to give Alabama some level of difficulty is the quarterback runs. I think that's where Auburn is uh, very good uh, running the ball with Peyton Thorne and or Robbie Ashford, and that could cause Alabama some issues. Now, I'm sure that uh, the Auburn's new staff has gone back and looked at what happened in last year's Alabama-Auburn game. Alabama inexplicably really gave up 320 yards rushing in that game. Auburn would very, very much like to repeat that. If Auburn is able to rush for 320 yards again in their home stadium, this very likely has one of the worst endings of all time for Alabama fans in Alabama-Auburn history, and I'd realize what's happened over there in the past at the end. But you can't let Auburn rush for 320 yards again. So, uh, And if Auburn did so, I would think it would be largely behind the feet and legs of Peyton Thorne and Robbie Ashford and not so much their running backs. Uh, although Jarquez Hunter is a talented kid, he's apparently just had issues all year long and hadn't really busted out. So I, I don't know that it would happen this week. So Auburn's run game spearheaded by the quarterbacks and their corners on defense, I think, are things that can cause Alabama some level of issue. But am I trading, uh, for instance, Alabama's corners for Auburn's? No. Am I trading Milrose legs for Thorns and Ashford's? No. So to show the vast discrepancy between the rosters as they stand today. Uh, I don't know that that Auburn has a single player that I would trade for. And I know, uh, you know, some people are going to say I'm being a little bit of a homer on that. Maybe, but I would like to hear the compelling case that, that an Auburn player is better at his position than the Alabama players are. Their kicker is a good player. I mean, uh, McPherson from Fort Payne, good player. His older brothers in the NFL, this kid might be just as good. Better than Reichard? Probably not. So, Clint, I don't think the talent discrepancy has ever been bigger, uh, but that's exactly why Auburn's got a brand new coach because that's Hugh Freeze's marching orders when he walked in the door less than a year ago is, Hugh, you got to fix this roster. Yeah, and that's that's where I'm having a hard time with this because you want to separate – um, you know, the X's and O's, I, I wouldn't say separate because that's obviously it's the most important factor of this entire thing. I mean, emotion certainly plays into it. The environment plays into it. Uh, but the talent discrepancy between the two teams right now, um, Alabama's, <clears throat> they're going to need to get out coached on Saturday if they're going to get beat like Hugh yeah. Freeze. And granted, when you look at the New Mexico State game, it, the the approach, it felt like when you watch I don't think that Auburn actually ever felt threatened to be beaten by New Mexico State. Uh, I mean, that's my opinion. Maybe I'm wrong on it. But when you look, it kind of felt like the approach was, okay, we might. I mean, it's a, it's a lost season. You're not trying to get style points, really. I mean, as long as you're getting victories, even if you play New Mexico State close, it's really not that big of a deal as long as you win. Now, granted, that's with the caveat that you are a very competitive against Alabama or B beat Alabama. So it kind of feels like that maybe the approach was we're going to get a victory over New Mexico state. Regardless, we might look a little sloppy. We might look a little ugly. We could have maybe looked better against them because we would have put more of an emphasis or an effort towards that game. But we don't have to put as much effort towards that. We can get a win, and then you turn around and you've been already putting a lot of your effort or energy towards Alabama. Much tougher matchup, and it's a season-altering match, uh, matchup. Uh, you know, If you can pull out a win over Alabama, everybody talks about Hugh Freeze and the difficulties that he's you know, presented Nick Saban in Alabama in the past, and everybody thought that, that was a big reason why Auburn brought him in in the first place. If he can get that win in year one, uh, you're talking about just the trajectory of the program, the momentum behind the program, the recruiting, all these different things would be very much in you know Hugh Freeze's favor and Auburn's favor compared to where it's at currently or where it was even at a week ago. Um, so there's a lot riding on this. I mean, even from a recruiting standpoint, there's not a whole lot of carryover between guys that Auburn's going after and guys that Alabama's going after, I think, at this point. I mean, obviously, they're always going to be battling for certain guys. But, you know, there are a couple, and those couple are pretty key. And there's rumors that have been circulating, obviously, you know, with Perry Thompson and what happened with that, flipping from 
you know, Alabama to Auburn and what that meant. And then, you know, uh, Demarcus Riddick and all these different guys, obviously our recruiting guys would be the ones to talk to on that. But it's like you're trying, you got to get the horses if you want to be competitive. Um, and, and getting a win on Saturday would go a, a long way in a lot of areas as far as donors and excitement around the program. And, you know, so it, it, just to me, I, I wonder exactly how much time this Auburn coaching staff was already putting towards Alabama. I mean, am I crazy for thinking that? I know a lot of people have brought it up. Uh, you know, is that something that you think, you know, very, it, it could be a very real possibility? Oh, I, I almost would guarantee it. I mean, in terms of uh, Auburn has probably spent extra time on Alabama and I'm counting the week of New Mexico State. I'm counting the fall as a whole, the spring as a whole, summer work. However, I think they spend, I mean, it's just my my take and, and people can say this wrong, but I, I think the Alabama game means so much to the Auburn people. They sort of work on it all year <laughs> and, and, and that, that sort of defines them. But I do think in particular that they worked on some Alabama stuff during New Mexico. I would just argue in terms of like what advantage that gives Auburn, I would say is next to zero. I mean, and I'm no, I'm no Hugh Freeze. I'm no Nick Saban. To me, it's zero. Just simply in the sense that, look, Alabama's not running the Air Force offense or the Navy's offense or Georgia Tech's offense under Paul Johnson. Alabama's not running the uh, Houston Cougars offense in the late 80s. It's not tricky. Nothing that Alabama does is particularly tricky. They're not going to face a single snap that Alabama uh, throws at them that they have not seen in the first 11 games, whether it's RPOs, throws, quarterback runs, indoor, Kendrick Law on the end around, uh, toss sweeps to Jace McClellan, inside traps, inside zone. Alabama doesn't do anything tricky. There is nothing that the extra prep is going to prepare you for. What Alabama does is they bring more good players than you've got, and they just play football. <laughs> and all, all the work in the world on Alabama is not going to change the fact that they've got to block Dallas Turner and Chris Braswell, and they've got to probably put two guys on Tim Keehan, and they're going to have to spy Jalen Milrow, and Alabama's inside receiver is going to be lined up on a safety, which is a, a good matchup in this particular week. Uh, I mean, Alabama's just got dudes. And that's the Alabama issue. You, Alabama's got dudes. It's not something you can solve X's and O's wise. So I don't doubt that Auburn did extra work. I think some of it might be psychological. You know, hey, guys, we've done a lot of work on those guys. We've worked harder on them than they've worked on us. Maybe that's some sort of psychology, psychological trick. But, hey, I, I'm not trying to be cocky or some Homer Alabama fan when I say this, but I'm like, hey, they can devote every Tuesday all fall long to Alabama. It's not going to change the fact that Alabama's got a lot more good players than they do, and 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 Alabama's very likely to uh, to come out on top in this game. Well, uh, yeah, uh, I agree with that to a certain extent. I do think at the end of the day, the players matter. Um, now, granted, we've seen some teams in the past. Gus Malzahn was really good at throwing some new wrinkles in offensively. And being yeah. able to score some gimmicky stuff, and I think he will have some of that. I wouldn't be shocked at all if they scored that, a touchdown. That makes or two. sense. Uh, you know, from now, granted, from what you were kind of referring to was more so Alabama's offense versus their defense, which right. I think is obviously you're very much correct. And the and I think that they have more of a belief in their defense versus Alabama's offense, especially with it being in Jordan Hare Stadium with that crowd at their back. Uh, mm -hmm. You've seen some really good Alabama offense. I would say really good. Obviously, the offensive line was a, uh, you know, a, a little bit of a struggle uh, a couple of years ago. But in Jordan Hare Stadium, when you had Bryce Young at quarterback, you had John Mechie at receiver. Um, you know, you had Jamison Williams. Obviously, Jamison Williams, I think, had gotten tossed pretty early in that game due to a targeting penalty. Um, but you know, it, it's they still were able to provide some challenges. And Auburn defensively, while um, you know, it hadn't always been reflected. I think they're a much more advanced team on that side of the football. And when you combine that with a home crowd advantage, I do think they can present some challenges for Alabama's offense. There's no doubt in my mind that they can. Uh, we've seen much lesser, uh, you know, less talented teams cause Alabama's offense issues. Now, granted, in recent weeks, post-bye week, really I would say the start of the second half of the Tennessee game, even though 
Tommy Reese, I think in the first half, was starting to dial up some new things, throw in some new wrinkles. You saw the personnel, the guys who were actually on the field, the players, get a lot more comfortable with that in the second half of the Tennessee game. And then post bye week, after they've had some time to kind of go back and say, okay, this is what we've added. See, it works. Th- these are some things that we can you know, start to build on as far as that's concerned throw some more variation in there, do some different things. And it feels like you've seen a completely different offense from Alabama. Uh, but, and, and I will say what makes me a lot more confident in their ability to go to Jordan Hare stadium and, and be able to continue at least to some degree, what they've been doing in recent weeks is the fact that they went to Lexington and they had pretty much their way with Kentucky's defense for the most part. I mean, there were some lulls in there. There were some lulls this past weekend against UT Chattanooga. That's, I think that's almost to be expected uh, to some degree from this offense. But for the most part, they were able to run the football effectively when they wanted to. They got chunk gains. Um, you know, they were able to throw the football effectively. The vertical shots continue to be there pretty much every week. Um, and so, you know, that makes you feel more confident in their ability to go on the road this weekend. But I also will say this will be a 10 times different environment for that offense compared to even something like Lexington. And I would say Auburn defensively is very comparable. Uh, I would probably even say in some ways they're better than Kentucky. Um, but the, you also have that extra motivating factor maybe that even a team like Kentucky didn't have. I think defensively Auburn is a challenge. I mean, I think they're uh... – and I mean it as a compliment, even doesn't sound like it. I mean it as one. That's the, I think they're a typical SEC defense. By that, I mean every team in the SEC is pretty good on defense. There's only a couple that maybe aren't, like, to be honest, Vanderbilt and LSU. Uh, everybody else is some degree of, of good. And I think Auburn is some degree of good. And when you're a good SEC defense, you're really good. And, and I do think it'll be a challenge in a way that Kentucky was a challenge. And we did see, as Clint pointed out, there were possessions and series uh, going up against Kentucky's defense that were a little problematic for Alabama. It wasn't just racing up and down the field like the F1 race in, in, in Vegas. I mean, it, it, there were some stops in there. And there was even a time that Kentucky outscored Alabama 14-7 to in the middle of that game before Alabama kind of restored order and went back to the butt-kicking ways of the first quarter. Um, I, I could see something extremely similar happen at Auburn. I'd also remember this. Kentucky sort of got up for the game because Alabama's coming to town. Auburn is going to get up in a way that's much different than that. Th- this means a lot more to them than it meant to the Kentucky group. So I'm expecting an even more spirited and emotional uh, Auburn defense than you got from Kentucky, too. So, you know, uh, we'll we'll do predictions at the end, or or, or maybe we'll do them at, at Beal uh, on the uh, on the you know however you want to do the staff prediction. I'll be ready, but uh, you know I'm not going to pick Alabama to score 49 like they did against Kentucky. That's myself speaking for myself. I'm not. I, I, I think Auburn's defense is better, and they're certainly going to be better playing at a fevered pitch uh, that I expect to see. Now that said, Alabama's very difficult to defend because of Jalen Milrow. Uh, Jalen Milrow is, I think, the reason Alabama will win this game because unlike Auburn's quarterbacks, Milrow can hurt you in multiple ways, not just with the quarterback run, but it is the quarterback run that's going to set up his ability to make the plays downfield with his arm, and those will be the difference in the game. And and I feel like Alabama's better than Auburn at really all the positions, but they're especially better at quarterback, and ultimately that's going to be the difference in this game. Well, and the other aspect of this that's kind of different than Kentucky, you've got the rivalry factor. Uh, you've got the fact that potentially you had Auburn looking ahead and doing some extra preparation, and that certainly helps. But it's the time of the kickoff. Like the, you would think at 2.30 compared to 11 a.m., the crowd's going to be a lot more energized by the end of the game. I mean, it's getting dark early nowadays. You're going to start to get into that night game environment. It's probably going to be rocking in Jordan-Hare Stadium. So I think from that aspect, it's going to be, you know, a little bit more intense. Uh, and when you look at Jalen Milrow in two of Alabama's three road games this year, uh, they played at Mississippi State, they played at Texas A&M, and they played at Kentucky. And two of those three so far, he's thrown an interception. He's definitely gotten a lot better at managing his turnovers. 
but the biggest difference to me from now compared to the beginning of the year, and we've talked about this, is his ability to overcome when he does make one of those mistakes. But my point is, is that uh, I could see him turning the football over. You know, Auburn presenting something defensively, maybe disguising something, confusing him a little bit. Uh, but what you have to feel good about if that does happen, if you're an Alabama fan, is when that happens, it doesn't feel like a colossal mistake like it did against Texas. Like from the first interception that he threw, it seemed to everybody was like nothing's changed. You know, the struggles that he had the year before as far as turning the football over, not seeing stuff, um, you know, it just it, it had a very negative vibe to it. And then you that you obviously had that one that happened in the fourth quarter as well. That was pretty crippling. But since then, I would, and I wouldn't even say since then, I mean, he's made some mistakes and you've kind of wondered or worried the interception against Texas A&M. Alabama's defense immediately responds and gets them the football back. But when that happened with the way that game was trending, you start to wonder, okay, um, is this going to be one of those kind of costly mistakes against another Texas team? Uh, ended up not being that way. But nowadays, when you see him make a, a, a bad throw or a bad decision or whatever, his ability to respond, like you don't, as a fan, and I think that this is the same way probably teammates feel, coaches, everybody involved. When he makes a mistake, you're, you don't feel like it's this detrimental, oh, my gosh, this, this is about to go off the rails. It's just, hey, uh, it was a bad – it's kind of like when Bryce Young with the interception. You never were worried, oh, my gosh, everything's about to fall apart. I don't think anybody predicted that when he threw that interception against LSU at the beginning of that game last year that you know they were going to have the kind of struggles that they did. It was like, man, they moved the football right down the field. He made a you know a, a poor throw. I think it was the correct decision. A poor throw, a little bit behind him, got pegged. It is what it is. They move the football pretty easily. I, I f- you know think they'll probably continue to do that. So that has to make you feel better. Um, but I wouldn't be shocked at all if they, like I said, did some things. They're gonna be super aggressive. They don't have a whole lot to lose. No one's really giving them a chance. And that is one thing in these types of games where, you know, Auburn they're bowl eligible. So it doesn't matter, you know, it's either six and six or seven and five. And so from that standpoint, you've already got your bowl game. And when you look, it's like, I mean, outside of the continuing negative momentum after New Mexico State, if you get blown out by Alabama, that's certainly not good. But in a lot of ways, Auburn doesn't have a whole lot to lose. So you're going to see them take some chances. They're going to do some things offensively against Alabama's defense. They probably don't feel great about that matchup, whether you look at the offensive line. I think one of the most lopsided uh, mismatches of this game, in my opinion, is Alabama's secondary against Auburn's receivers. They've really struggled to consistently get in separation. Um, and when they have got separation, they've really struggled to bring the football in. And they're going against by far the best secondary that, that they've played all year with a ton of playmakers pretty much all over the place and could potentially, I don't know if, you know, for sure that it'll be this way, but. Could very well be fully healthy if Jalen Key is able to return. You got Devontae Smith back. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's a dangerous matchup for Auburn for sure. Yeah, Alabama could uh, come out super aggressive themselves on that side of the ball, Clint, defensively in the sense that I think this might might be a game you feel pretty good about putting Kool-Aid McKinstry at one corner and Terry on Arnold at the other and then uh, not worrying about those two guys and just playing football against the other nine. <laughs> because Kool-Aid and, 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 and Terry on take care of those two, take them out of the game. Now you can be really aggressive with what you do with the other safeties, uh, with uh, with Malachi Moore at star uh, and those linebackers. You can be super aggressive knowing that uh, Kool-Aid and, and Terry on Arnold have taken the outside receivers out of the game. So Alabama can be very aggressive. I agree with you that Hugh is likely to not just throw wrinkles at Alabama, but just throw the whole curveball at Alabama. I think Alabama is likely to see – some Auburn snaps and, and plays that they have not seen on the 11 games of tape because Auburn has saved them for this or Auburn has recently drawn them up for this after watching a lot of Alabama tape that uh, in terms of things that they think will work. But, you know, that also is a two-edged sword. You know, if you think, hey, I'm going to pull this special stuff out and, and, and have some success against Alabama, if I'm an Auburn fan, I'm like, you know, this would have been better used in a game we could win and maybe we would be going to uh, the Birmingham Bowl instead of uh, watching everybody else play on TV. <laughs> you know, if you if you did this last week, but instead you saved it for the game that you you, you weren't going to win anyway. You know, but but regardless of all that Auburn politics, regardless of that, uh, I do think there will be some wrinkles, and it's a good 
it's a good thing for Alabama. Hey, you got to learn to adjust on the fly because you don't know that Georgia's going to go and play straight up and do exactly as they've done the previous 12 games or or whatever you might see in the bowl game or the college football playoff. So all college football players need to learn to adjust uh, as a game is going on. We, we, we've joked before about, you know, second half adjustments and kind of how silly that, that whole thing is. You need to adjust right now. You know, whatever we're doing that's not working, stop and do something else. And uh, and it's good practice. So you know that, that you're going to see some of that. Now, there's, you know, there's only so much you can do. Auburn's not coming out in the wishbone. They're not coming out in a five wide run and shoot and putting the game on Peyton Thorne and saying, Peyton, you're going to throw it 45 times and, and we're going to win this game. Uh, I hope I hope that's what they do. I, I, I think that that wouldn't probably go very well. Um, but in the end, Clint, uh, I, I'll, in this like like I started the show and that's Alabama's got more good football players in Auburn. And, and regardless of, of what they cook up in the kitchen, uh, Bama's just putting more dudes on, on the on the on the playing field than they are. Yeah, and if I was Alabama, um, sometimes in these types of games, and it's you know Alabama tends as a program really under Nick Saban, they're disciplined, they're very structured, um, and so you don't always see the kind of risk taking or aggression that maybe other programs do. Uh, they're a lot more conservative, really, because they know we have more talent. We're going to be better than 98% of the teams that we step on the field with. Um, and so that's kind of just always been the approach in a lot of ways. But in this particular game, you know, I, I, I'll compare it. I don't remember what the game was. I think it was Tennessee, if I'm not mistaken. In the first half against Tennessee, Alabama ran some three-man stuff, uh, you know, some three-man fronts defensively. They were a little bit conservative in how they were playing Tennessee's offense based a lot previous on how the previous matchup went, but also, you know, you had a lot of new personnel. So I thought they were kind of playing towards that or gearing towards that in a way, but they quickly realized, I mean, a, the, the, the players weren't comfortable in that type of setting. Uh, they weren't in hunt mode. And I feel like this particular defense under Kevin Steele and Travaris Robinson they like to be aggressive. They like to be the one that's in the attack mode. They don't want to be on their heels being more conservative. So even though Alabama has such a talent advantage, uh, if I were Alabama, we'll see if they are. Maybe they go in a completely opposite direction. Nick Saban's got you know a couple of more national championships under his belt than I do um, in his coaching career. So maybe I would probably lean towards going his direction. But if I were the one making the call – I would probably be the one that sets the tone, and I come out with quite a bit of aggression. You try to get the the crowd out of her, crowd out of it early. You rely on your players to kind of build on that aggressive momentum and really take control of the game. Whether you're talking about offensively and running the football and setting the tone, being physical, maybe taking some of those shots downfield. I like you know the play call, uh, the first uh, play uh, against UT Chattanooga this past weekend, where they took that shot. You know, I wouldn't mind seeing something like that in Jordan Hare Stadium with Jalen Milrow. Uh, and that can come back to bite you. I mean, if he throws an interception, a uh, crowd will be rocking. I mean, so will they do that? Probably not. But I think at least to some degree, they need to be the aggressors in this matchup, especially early on. If you give Auburn hope early, it's it can be a 60-minute game. I, I don't know how many times I've said that watching Nick Saban's Alabama teams over the years – not Auburn in particular, but yes, Auburn at least two years ago and other games where I felt Alabama had a significant personnel advantage, but you made errors early, you made mistakes early, and you gave the other team belief. And belief is a powerful thing. Hope is a powerful thing. Uh, I couldn't agree with Clint more. I think when you're playing against a team that is emotional and playing against you, if you can somehow blunt the emotion and take the emotion out of it early, they're not left with much. And I think giving them no hope early is the key towards cruising in this game and doing things like saving some legs for your vital players and maybe even ending the game with Ty Simpson at quarterback and not having to go the whole 60 minutes with Jalen Milrow. I think for Alabama to have a game like that, Clint, that that's going to it's going to require a lot in the first quarter, not the fourth quarter, the first quarter. And, and, and that's by removing any chance that 
Auburn feels like they have a win of the game. Let's be honest. Auburn's offense has not been great. It's not been good. And if you hold them to a couple of three and outs early and, and score on your first couple of possessions and build that two and three score lead, I think it's going to be hard for Auburn to dig deep and find some want to. I mean, because they've seen this movie. You know, this it's, this wouldn't be their, their first rodeo here. It would be like, how are we going to score 21 against these guys? You know, and, and you know, they're probably going to score more. It's just the early in the second quarter. So uh, that quick start could be the key towards uh, resting guys in the fourth quarter because wouldn't that be nice? You know, Georgia – is playing Georgia Tech, I bet they have a goal of let's crush these guys and let's rest in the fourth quarter while all, while Alabama's in a 60-minute game because Georgia played a 60-minute game in Jordan-Hare. I wouldn't be surprised, Clint, if Georgia thinks Alabama's in for a 60-minute game. We're going to crush Georgia Tech and we're going to rest our guys and that'll give us one more advantage for next week. So Alabama needs to match that. Yeah, that's a good point. And <clears throat> I will say it's it's – it's not by design by any means, but it, it sure is a pretty nice advantage uh, for Georgia to be able to play Georgia Tech, who, you know, you, you never know. Um, they've And they've had some good teams in the past, and they've won some games against Georgia. But for the most part, pretty much every year, if you're Georgia, especially in recent years when they've been really good and they're making it quite – I wish I, they were making it quite a bit, I guess, under Mark Rick too. But um, it, it must be nice to be playing a Georgia Tech type of team um, because you kind of get it's not you teach Chattanooga, it's not New Mexico State. Georgia Tech is a much better program. They're going to be a lot more difficult to contain, but that's a program right now that's definitely in transition, and and they're still trying to figure some things out. And Georgia should have a pretty easy time, and they should be able to get their uh, get some some starters out, you know, fairly quickly, and they should be able to get some guys healthy. But that is what it is. I mean, it's not like that was by design, and it is just that's their rivalry. It's the in-state program and you know it is what it is i'm not going to harp on that too much but when you look in recent years i mean obviously you had the 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 overtime flash uh two years ago uh the multi overtime 22 24 you look back at 2019 uh alabama lost in jordan hair you look back at 2017 uh alabama lost uh you look at 2015 alabama did win but it was 29 13 it wasn't some blowout victory and then the time before that, Alabama lost in 2013 on the kick six. So there have been some really good Auburn teams in there. I mean, obviously, but there's also been some not so great. And, and, and in fact, the similarities as far as Auburn is concerned between this group and two years ago when they gave Alabama all they wanted for four quarters there are some differences, but I don't think it's as drastic as people think. I mean, Peyton Thorne, if you look back, I mean, TJ Finley was starting two years ago and he was the backup. And then he got an ankle injury early in that game to where pretty much he was stationary and stuck in the pocket for the entire night, which definitely made things easier on Alabama. But, um, you know, so I understand there's a lot of people out there that are telling you Alabama is going to handle Auburn. It's going to be a blowout. And I could see it should be. It absolutely should be. But I also want to remind people, emotion plays a big part in football. And Auburn right now, they got embarrassed, I guess is, is the word. Uh, I, they're a team that could tuck their tail and fold as a result of this, or they can come back swinging. They're backed in a corner, and you know you never know what can happen. So I just want to caution Alabama fans. I'm not trying to be too negative and say, oh, you know, Alabama's in for a dogfight. But anybody that thinks, okay, we need to be approaching this pretty much the same way we were with Kentucky, where it's, you know, as Terry was looking ahead to Auburn, everybody else is now looking ahead to, to Georgia because they're not worried about Auburn. I don't think that needs to be the case because this can turn into a dogfight if Alabama lets it. But if they go out there, the, the, the Kentucky game could have too. Uh, and But Alabama came out there early, slap, you know, hit them in the mouth on both sides of the football and they took control early in that game. Obviously, the muff punt played a huge part in the momentum changing of that one. You can't have stuff like that happen on Saturday. But if I, if you see Alabama take that same approach or that same mentality, they could absolutely blow Auburn out. But there's no guarantee that that's going to happen, so you can't bank and automatically assume that it's going to. Any 
Alabama fan that's older than two years old uh, should know to be a, at least a little anxious about this because we, it was just two years ago that a much better Alabama team than what Auburn had, uh, when I say nearly lost, I mean, that that game was was given up for dead a couple different times, and Alabama pulled it out. Now, let's remember Alabama's defense played really well that night. Auburn generated almost zero offense all night because Alabama's defense just didn't allow much. Alabama's offense, however, was a mess, uh, in part due to injury. It was true that Alabama was missing some guys that I think really hurt them in this game. But the reason that Auburn was able, I think, to force a, a last-minute drive in an overtime clip, the reason Auburn was able to do that was their defensive front, somehow, some way, their defensive front found a way to whip Alabama. And I'm not talking about fight to a draw. I'm not talking about keep them in the game. I'm talking about their defensive front whipped Alabama. That's a fact that's not been lost on Auburn this week in preparation for this game. It's not a fact that's been lost on Alabama, I hope, uh, in their practices this week. Because in my mind, for Auburn to have a chance and for this game to look like it did in 21, that would start with the idea that Alabama's offensive line is going to get whipped. And uh, the good news for Alabama fans, I think this offensive line is better than 2021. I think it's more solid. I think it's just illustrated by the fact that two years ago, Seth was basically a freshman, a redshirt freshman. Now he's like a redshirt junior. So Seth is better. Uh, J.C. Latham is NFL ready. Tyler Booker is a pro football player at left guard. Caden Proctor is a future pro football player. I don't think Alabama will be as leaky as they were that night or as easy to take advantage of up front. Uh, and I think that's why it won't look like 2021. But like I said, if you're an Alabama fan and you're over two years old, then you should know why to be at least a little anxious about this. Yeah, you can't have any Damian George performances, you know, speaking yep. candidly. And it wasn't just yep. him. I mean, obviously, Chris Owen struggled too. Um, but that was a matchup that Auburn knew they could consistently get whenever they wanted to. I don't think their edge rushers are as good right now. A lot of their pressures generated from their, you know, jack linebacker, um, you know, kind of a hybrid, and then, you know, their off ball linebacker. Uh, Eugene Asante, he's going to be a guy who they're going to send a ton, kind of like Alabama's ultra aggressive with sending their off ball linebackers. Auburn kind of does the same thing, and he's got, you know, multiple sacks. He's had a, quite a successful year so far relative to the rest of their pass rush. They don't have or haven't had dominant ends as far as pressuring the quarterback. Uh, so you don't have to worry about that quite as much. But I will say, if you are Auburn, you're probably looking at Caden Proctor and you're saying, that's a guy that's improved, but we're going to see just how much we're going to really try to do some things and try to test him to see if, you know, he crumbles under the pressure. Uh, and, and I fully expect him to be able to hold up. I expect Alabama to do some things to, to help him out in case that does end up happening. But if you were a fan, that's probably something to keep an eye on because you're trying to look for that one spot in particular. I mean, you obviously, if you can get multiple, that's the more, the better, but if you can get that one spot that you can consistently say, okay, Jalen Milrow is going to have a hard time all night because this one particular matchup, and it could be multiple guys, but just it, you're attacking one spot along the offensive line and you're able to get a win at such a high rate that it's like pretty much every time Milrow goes to drop back, he can't get on a timing, he can't get his rhythm going. That's what Bryce Young dealt with. Every time he went to go step back and throw a pass, I mean, Damian George or Chris Owens or somebody was getting beat there at right tackle. And it's a matchup that Auburn knew that they had all night, and they certainly took advantage of it. Uh, you know, offensively, kind of switching gears a little bit. Um, you know, Auburn is – I don't think they were doing as much RPO stuff early, which was strange under Hugh Freeze because that's kind of his bread and butter. But since they've started doing more of that – now, New Mexico State was a little bit of a different situation. But since they started implementing more of that in their offense – that's when you started to see them kind of hit their stride and have a lot more success offensively consistently. Um, but then on top of that, when you look at Jarquez Hunter, I mean, he had like a four-game stretch where he had over 500 yards rushing right before this New Mexico State game. So four, it was, uh, it was Ole Miss, it was Mississippi State, it was Vanderbilt, and it was Arkansas. So no world-beating defenses there by any means. But, I mean, he was putting up 183, 144, 109, uh, 91 against Ole Miss 
was doing a lot of things in the passing game, uh, you know, as a receiver as well, scoring multiple touchdowns. And that also is a key to this game, in my opinion, too, is when Auburn's able to run the football effectively, the other elements of their offense performs a lot better, which you would naturally expect. But I think more so with Auburn, it's just if they can't get their run game going, they can't beat you. They can't counter. They can't drop back and throw the football. Their receivers don't create enough separation. Their best pass catcher is a, a tight end, uh, Fairweather, who is a very good player. That's someone to keep an eye on. But, you know, the like I said, the receivers are dropping footballs. They can't create separation. It's just, it's ugly. And, and even when they do get open, Peyton Thorne's not always seeing guys. He's bailing early. So I think Alabama's defensive front is going to be pretty important. If you can stop the run game and force things onto Peyton Thorne's shoulders and really just that entire passing game shoulders, I think that bodes really well for Alabama's chances to get a sizable uh, victory on Saturday. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the first thing. If, if, I'm, if I'm addressing Auburn's team and I'm Hugh Freeze, I start with the idea of, guys, they're not invincible. You, y'all ran for 320 yards. I wasn't even here. Y'all ran for 320 yards on these guys last year, and they're not any better. Uh, they think they're better, but they're not. They're, he's going to point out the numbers, which are pretty shocking uh, until this past week. Uh, the number of points Alabama gave up per game and the number of yards they gave up per game were identical to what they did a year ago. Hugh Freeze is going to bring up all that stuff, and he's going to say, you ran for 320 yards on these guys last year, and this is my promise to you, as Hugh Freeze, I'm sure, often you know, uh, up there at his pulpit when he's talking to his team. This is what I'm promising you. If you give me 320 yards on the ground this time around, we will win the game, and it will be the greatest moment of your football lives and all that stuff. Uh, so. It's, it's Auburn's only path. Like I said, as an Alabama fan, we should be begging Auburn, no, 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 throw it 50 times. Put it all on Peyton Thorne, throw into those receivers. Uh, you know, Hugh, Hugh Freeze didn't get to this, this job in the SEC because he's a football dummy. I mean, he, he's, he knows there's one path to Auburn winning this game, and that is having as much success as they had on the ground a year ago. So that means quarterback runs. That means Hunter having maybe his best game or certainly up there. And it means Auburn uh, doing some things up front, whatever they did last year that worked. So really Alabama, you know, in terms of what their charge is, is to look at last year's tape and, uh, and plug those leaks on the run defense and say, not this year, not this year. Y'all, y'all try those same set of plays again. It's not going to work this time. Cause I don't care what the numbers say. We all know we're better on defense. Jimmy knows Clint knows. Everyone on the round table, BOL knows <laughs> Alabama's defense is better than they were a year ago. Uh, don't find solace in those numbers because you're going to be surprised uh, on Saturday. So I don't think Auburn will rush for 320 yards. I really don't. I think Auburn may rush for more yards than we want. Here's a little inside baseball how I predict things sometimes. Look, numbers are numbers and math is math. Okay. Auburn's not going to throw for 250 yards in this game. They're not. They're probably going to end up with right around what? 300 yards, right? That's that's around what Alabama allows per game is 300 yards. And Auburn's not as good on offense as most of the teams Alabama has faced, honestly, in the SEC. uh, Auburn's just not as good. So I think, Clint, it's very fair to guess, "Ah, I'll put Auburn at 300 yards. Well, they're not getting it through the air. They're not. <laughs> they're probably, I should say, they're probably not. How many you want to put them down for in the air? 100? 150? Well, that means there's only two ways to advance the ball in the air or on the ground, right? So I do think Auburn's going to have more success than we want on the ground. That's because they won't have it in the air, and that's because Alabama's not going to hold them to 80 yards. Alabama's probably going to hold them to around 300 yards. So that's where I'm coming from with a lot of my predictions on this game is looking at it through that prism that they're going to find yards and they're probably going to be on the ground because it's harder to imagine them finding more success through the air against Alabama than they've had in the other games. Uh, I think most games play out uh, as you would expect. And now there's 11 games of tape to watch and 11 sets of numbers to look at. So I do think Auburn will have some success on the ground, but not 320. If so, buckle up. This is 60 minutes decided at the end if they do. 
Yeah, and a big aspect of that rushing success last year was, you know, Robbie Ashford. You know, he had 120 plus yards. He had a couple of touchdowns. Obviously, uh, Jarquez Hunter had a big game as well, and and he's been having a lot of success. He didn't against New Mexico State. Part of that was just game script, and you know, New Mexico State was able to control the line of scrimmage. They were able to kind of dictate tempo. They were able to control clock, and you know, like I said, really just take control of the game. And so it felt like that Auburn was in reaction mode for a majority of it, and they didn't really run the football like a, to the degree that I think they could have. So it wasn't necessarily Jarquez Hunter's fault that he didn't have uh, the same level of success or at least similar or close to it as he had in the previous four games. He should be right now, in my opinion, riding a very strong five-game streak. And so Alabama definitely needs to be wary of him. He's one of their top playmakers. They're going to try to rely on him to – you know, if they're worried about their defense against Alabama's offense, if they believe in this growth that we've seen from Alabama, um, you know, it, it would be probably beneficial for them to, they're going to take some shots and, and try to catch Alabama off guard. I almost guarantee it. But, you know, they also could rely on that run game, if, especially if they get a lead early by some maybe fluky stuff or throwing some wrinkle in there, something different, something new. And it you know gives them a seven nothing lead. I could totally see them really trying to hammer out Hunter, and and having success that way and grinding as much clock keeping Alabama's offense off the field. But um, I guess my next question for you would be: Do you feel like you know we haven't seen a whole lot of Robbie Ashford in recent weeks? Uh, it kind of was a two quarterback thing for you know most of the the beginning of the season, and then it really started kind of condensing down to just Peyton Thorne. He's been playing better, even though he did not have a good performance. Uh, against New Mexico State, um, but Ashford he did, he completed less than fifty percent of his passes last year against Alabama. But he had a touchdown. He had less than two hundred yards passing. But he added that element with uh, I want to say he had like seventeen or eighteen or nineteen carries somewhere in the high teens. He had one hundred and twenty plus yards, a couple of touchdowns. He made you know a couple of really wild plays with his legs. If Auburn feels like they need to add something different in a wrinkle and maybe if they don't feel confident in their ability to throw the football effectively maybe they turn to a combination of hunter and and robbie ashford as kind of a way to throw alabama off guard compared to what maybe they're expecting going in do you think that's a possibility bad i pulled a luke robinson there i was muted <laughs> it was, it's only a matter it's only a matter of time hope you're listening luke i'm sorry <laughs> i can never make fun of you I can never make fun of luke again uh now uh here's my thing you know alabama plays more than one back uh and the reason they play more than one back is because they want to split the load right i mean jace can't you know you don't want jace at 25 28 carries not really built for that not really his game same thing with roy dell uh same thing with the younger backs I think Auburn going into the game knowing that one of their most uh, – the, the, the thing that might work best for them is the QB run. So they're probably going to even do it a little more than normal. They might need to split the load. And then, then you throw in the fact that Ashford had the success last year against Alabama running the ball. There was some moments uh, where Alabama had some difficulty with him. I, I think based on the fact that he had success against Alabama a year ago – and you want to run the quarterback a lot. Look, if you're going to run Peyton Thorne 25 times, that's 25 times he's getting hit by Dallas Turner and Chris Braswell and Deontay Lawson and Caleb Downs. I mean, I I think Auburn goes into this game knowing the QB run is going to be a thing for us. We're going to do it a lot. We're going to do it on designs, and we're going to do it on some scrambles. We're going to be one read and, and, and tuck it and run. I think they go on with the idea that they're going to play two quarterbacks so they can split some of that load because it's unlikely Peyton Thorne can finish the game if he has literally 25 quote unquote carries in this game. Yeah, I could I could see the same thing. Uh, now, granted, more so in the sense that I could see it, part of it could be dictated. I, I think they will have a package at least for Robbie Ashford. I think they'll have some sort of role prepared for him. I could be wrong on that, uh, but I wouldn't be shocked at all. It, because we just haven't seen him in a while. I'm sure Alabama's preparing for him. They're going to have all their bases covered or as many as possible. But when you look at him, it just the fact that you haven't seen him in a while, 
you can kind of catch Alabama off guard a little bit and maybe throw some new things in there. But I also think early on they're probably going to use Peyton Thorne as a runner. I mean, that's, he has been a runner. He's very underrated in that sense. He's not Jalen Milrow. I've seen people on Twitter compare him and say that, you know, why well, that's absurd. Uh, yeah, but he's a lot more. I would say he's he's more Ty Simpson. I mean, really, from a running standpoint. Um, like yeah, I mean, maybe a little bit more. Maybe a, a little. Maybe there's some kind of cross between Jalen Milrow and Ty Simpson, but I think he's a lot closer to the Ty Simpson side of that scale as a runner. Uh, very underrated as far as an athlete and Alabama is going to be prepared for that. They're not going to underestimate that. It's been one of the biggest uh, offensive yardage, uh, you know, avenues that Auburn has had this year, but I think they'll test Alabama's defense and see what kind of success he's having as a runner. And if he's able to get the job done, the fact that he brings more of that passing element, even though it hadn't been great and you might, you might ride him as much as you possibly can. But it's also possible maybe if he's getting bottled up and he just doesn't have the ability to turn the corner against some of the the speed that Alabama is going to bring to the field, maybe they turn to Robbie Ashford a little bit more. And who knows if he's having the success and he's the one generating uh, the offense and he's you know getting first downs and moving the football and putting them in in some scoring positions, they could turn to him pretty much full time and just adopt this you know one game plan where it's just like we're going to hammer the football and. You know, do some different things, and and that could be what helps open up the run game, the traditional run game with Hunter, uh, because Alabama's run defense, interior run defense, has been pretty solid. You know, so far this year, they've given up some chunk runs at times. Haven't always been disciplined on some stretch plays uh, as far as gap integrity and things like that. But uh, for the most part, they've been been a very good run defense. So I could totally see that being something that Auburn tries to to do or implement. Uh, anything else? on this matchup before we hop out of here. We're not going to give exact score predictions. Uh, we'll probably, you know, reveal that on Thursday and then on Thursday night, Todd, if we do that. Um, I think that's still TBD because it's Thanksgiving. But if we do choose to go that route, we'll also be doing in that in video form as well. But do you have anything else that you want to add before we get into uh, kind of not exact score predictions, but just what are you feeling about this game? Yeah, one, one last thing about defending Auburn's run. Uh, where I said, you know, last year's defense has given up very similar numbers. I, I'm convinced this year's defense is better, and this is one of the reasons they're better. The defensive line, Alabama's defensive line, has been very good against the run. The run, you, we used to worry about the linebackers and the safeties making the tackles on the runs. This year, most of the, most of the time, opposing offense have had a hard time running the ball past Alabama's defensive line. Keenan, Otis, Aboigby. Damon Payne, Jamarian Latham, now James Smith playing every week. Tim Smith, great player this year. Alabama's defensive line is not going to allow Auburn to go off like they did last year in the run game. I, again, I, I think just playing with the math, uh, I'm going to just off the top of my head give Auburn 120 through the air and 180 on the ground. 180 is way too much, but let's be real. You're not going to hold them to – 120 yards passing and zero yards rushing. I mean, that that's that's highly unrealistic. So, but hey, you hold them to about 120 throwing it and 180 on the ground, the game should be easily won if that's all the production they muster. Yeah. I, I'm I don't I like the I like the prediction as far as the yardage numbers. Uh part of me thought about flipping it, uh, to be honest. Um but really, that's just that's. I feel like that's a little too bold. Uh, but yeah, I, I think ultimately, what this comes down to for me is can Alabama do what they did against Kentucky in a more difficult situation? The timing of the game, the crowd's going to be a lot more involved. The rivalry factor, the motivational factors. Uh, can they do what they did? Where they came out, there wasn't anxiety. There wasn't, you know, uh, they were a, a pretty sizable favorite. Uh, they came out pretty strong against UT Chattanooga this past weekend, despite the fact that you had the early kickoff, despite the fact that you had, you know, uh, you were a 44 and a half point favorite. They haven't always had hot starts this year. In fact, it was a huge problem for them for a majority of the year, but they've kind of r- corrected that uh, in recent weeks. Can they come out and capture momentum early in this one? And if they can, I, I don't think Auburn recovers. I think they're going to throw a lot at them early. They're going to try to take control of the game. 
And then if Alabama doesn't respond well to that, you get the crowd involved. You maybe have a couple of big plays. You're aggressive defensively. You get a big sack on third down. You're forcing a punt. Uh, you know, you, you score a touchdown off some fluky or gimmicky type play, something new, some new wrinkle, and then that whole place is rocking. You put yourself in a really difficult situation, and I don't think Alabama is going to, you know, come back and blow Auburn out from that point forward. I mean, the Tennessee game, they got down and everything was going against them, but you at least had the home crowd at your back. Uh, and also, I think the kickoff, uh, the coin toss, I guess is um, what I'm trying to say, that could be pretty critical in this. Uh, particular game. It's been important in some other games, Ole Miss, uh, Tennessee. And so that's something to look out for if you're an Alabama fan too. Do they win the toss? Do they win the toss? Are they able to defer to the second half? But um, if Alabama can take control early, I think it's going to really let the air out of Auburn sales. And I think Alabama handles business and they get a sizable victory. But that is what you need to be looking for. I think the early part of this game doesn't mean that it will stay on course of whatever is happening early. But I think more than likely, uh, early momentum one way or the other is going to dictate exactly how this game plays out. All right, Jimmy, I appreciate you hopping on here with me. I know we both got you know family stuff we're doing. It's it's right here on the holidays, but I love talking football with you as always, and we appreciate everybody tuning in. Um, I do want to bring up the fact that we got a promo deal going on right now, which I will put that up on the screen right now. Uh, you can get two months for one dollar. That's only a YouTube deal. You can't get that from the website. This is only for new subscribers, by the way. But you can't get this deal if you go to the BAM Online website. If you go to the Roundtable Message Board, this is just for you guys who are loyal and listening to the YouTube channel. We appreciate you guys. Two months for only a dollar. Use the promo code and uh, get yourself a deal, and then get over to the Roundtable Message Board. We're doing a ton of stuff over there. A lot of great conversation. Got a lot of stuff coming out as far as the uh, matchup this weekend. We've talked about some of it, but we're going to be breaking everything down. Jimmy's going to be handling a lot of the message board stuff. I'm going to be doing a lot of the written content. Charlie's doing great things, obviously covering the beat, but also doing some you know, premium content that you guys aren't going to get anywhere else. Travis with the video stuff and Tim, just it's a collective effort from everybody. Obviously, there's a lot of recruiting stuff going on right now with early signing day coming up. So now is the time that you need to be uh, joining up, and it's the perfect time for new subscribers with you getting two months for a dollar. So, Jimmy, uh, once again, buddy, I appreciate you hopping on here with me, man. Oh, I loved it, and uh, have a happy Thanksgiving to you and your uh, your whole family. Uh, just enjoy the holidays. Everyone listening, thanks so much for supporting this show. Thanks so much for supporting BOL, and uh, just thank you for listening. Uh, we, we really enjoy bringing this show to you, and uh, everyone have a happy holidays.